Welcome to the Deep Dive, your shortcut to being truly well-informed. Today, we're uh, plunging into the latest breakthroughs and, frankly, some significant challenges in the fight against HIV. We're covering everything from cutting-edge vaccine research to revolutionary new prevention methods and, yeah, even the complex world of global funding. We've taken a whole stack of sources, including a really in-depth overview from a specialist podcast, to kind of distill the most vital insights for you. That's right. Our mission here is really to extract those crucial nuggets of knowledge, give you that high level understanding without you having to wade through, you know, dense reports or super long discussions. We're talking about everything from pivotal scientific developments, major FDA approvals uh, to those often overlooked shifts in global health funding and policy. Critical stuff. Yeah, we're distilling a significant amount of information, stuff that in its original form might take you, what, 35, maybe 40 minutes to really digest. Exactly. And if you've ever found yourself wondering, you know, when is a real HIV vaccine finally coming? Or maybe what's the newest way to stay protected? Well, then this deep dive is precisely for you. We're going to get you completely up to speed on where things stand right now. Okay, let's unpack this. Right. So we're diving first into the world of HIV vaccine research. It's a field that saw, well, both surprising setbacks and some pretty exciting new avenues emerge recently. Our focus begins with um, a significant bump in the road. In late May, trials for some of the, let's say, most promising MRA HIV vaccines, you know, the same tech that gave us the COVID vaccine so quickly, well, they were unexpectedly paused. Yes, and the reason for that pause was uh, definitely concerning. A notable percentage of participants, somewhere between 7% and 18%, developed these unexpected skin conditions, specifically chronic hives. That rate was just far higher than anyone anticipated. So consequently, the NIH, which is a primary funder, they decided to halt support and they called for deeper safety reviews. Now, this is a pretty considerable concern because look, mRNA technology was seen as a leading hope, maybe the leading hope for an HIV vaccine. And that progress is now, well, effectively on hold. It needs a fundamental reassessment. Okay, so given all the potential we've seen from mRNA technology, I mean, how common are these kinds of unexpected outcomes in early stage trials? And what does this specific setback really mean for the future of mRNA and HIV research? Is it like a dead end? That's a critical question. And look, in early stage clinical trials, particularly with brand new technologies, adverse events are unfortunately not uncommon. That's precisely why these phases exist, right? To rigorously identify any safety issues before something progresses to larger populations. So while this specific outcome is definitely a setback, um, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the end for mRNA research in HIV. Not at all. It signals that the scientific community, well, they need to reassess maybe the delivery mechanisms, maybe the specific antigens being used, or perhaps even the dosing. It's a required safety check, basically, a reassessment. But the technology itself, it still holds promise and will likely be reevaluated for future applications. Okay, that offers a helpful sort of nuanced perspective. Thanks. But it's not all setbacks on the vaccine front, clearly. The scientific community seems to be diversifying its approach, exploring multiple pretty sophisticated strategies. Take, for instance, um, a completely different approach that showed promising updates mid-May. It's known as a germline targeting vaccine strategy. Sounds technical. It is technical, but it's a truly novel approach. Really interesting. Instead of just fighting an existing virus, it's about, well, teaching your immune system from the ground up teaching it how to produce what are called broadly neutralizing antibodies. Think of these like immune system master keys, powerful defenders that can target a huge array of HIV strains, even the ones that usually evade our defenses. Trials that were conducted in North America and also parts of Africa, they've shown successful activation of the desired immune response. So it's hinting that this might just be a transformative pathway for future vaccines. It's exciting. And complementing that germline strategy, there's yet another groundbreaking discovery emerging. This one from scientists at Scripps Research and the Karolinska Institute. They found a new target on the HIV spike protein. That's like the virus's key, right? The key HIV uses to unlock and infect our cells. Finding a new way to jam that key, well, that could dr dramatically change how we design vaccines. Cool. Precisely. And in the initial monk divinities, this new vaccine design actually neutralized 70% of HIV strains. 70%. 
Now, if these results can be confirmed in human trials, I mean, it would be monumental, a huge breakthrough. It could drastically shift how vaccines are built moving forward. What's truly fascinating here, I think, is the sheer resilience, the ingenuity of the scientific community. You know, when one promising avenue like those mRNA trials faces a hurdle. Yeah. Other diverse strategies are already advancing. This multi-pronged approach, you know, focusing on different immunological mechanisms and targets, it just demonstrates a really robust commitment to tackling HIV from all angles. Okay, so from vaccines, let's transition. Let's talk about a truly revolutionary breakthrough in prevention that just got the green light, linacapavir. It's branded as Yes2Go. This really is poised to be a profound shift in how we approach HIV prevention. It could potentially simplify protection for millions in a way, well, daily pills never really could. So the big date, June 18th, 2025, the FDA officially approved Yes2Go approved it as a twice-yearly injectable PU-EP medication. Now, PU-EP, that's pre-exposure prophylaxis, it's that groundbreaking preventative treatment where you take medication before potential exposure to virtually eliminate the risk of getting HIV. And think about the convenience here. Just two shots a year and you're protected. And the trial results, they're incredibly compelling. In studies with over 5,300 women who got the injection, there were zero, zero new HIV infections. And for men, another trial, 3,000 men recorded just two infections. And even those likely occurred before the first injection really had time to take full effect. Make no mistake, this is. This is prevention game changer. It really is a monumental step forward. For global HIV prevention efforts, this is huge. I mean, daily oral PAP, it's been revolutionary, absolutely. But adherence? That can be a significant challenge for many people. Right. Remembering every day. Exactly. A twice yearly injectable medication, it dramatically simplifies the whole regimen, makes it so much easier for individuals to maintain consistent protection. Just imagine, you know, a factory worker on a night shift or someone in a remote village or frankly, just anyone struggling to manage a daily pill regimen in the chaos of life. Two shots a year isn't just convenient. It's a monumental step towards making prevention a consistent reality for many, many more people, especially perhaps in communities where daily pill taking might be difficult, maybe due to lifestyle factors or even stigma. But, and this is a big but, this incredible scientific leap comes with a significant and uh, deeply troubling caveat. Yeah. While the scientific breakthrough is just undeniable, the pricing of Yastugo has sparked considerable outrage. Gilead, the pharmaceutical giant behind it, they price Yastugo at a whopping $28,218 per year in the U.S., $28,000. Wow. Yeah. This immediately drew fire from global health groups. Unaids, for instance, they claim the drug could be produced generically for just $25, $46 per year. $25 to $46. Exactly. So this breakthrough, it really illuminates a deeply uncomfortable truth, doesn't it? that even as science triumphs, the battle for global health equity just rages on. And it's often decided not in labs, but in boardrooms. Yeah, this highlights a massive ongoing debate. Pharmaceutical pricing, global access, it's huge. Now, companies, they argue they need to recoup research and development costs, and R&D is expensive. But the stark contrast between that market price in the U.S. and the estimated generic production cost well, it just points to a significant access barrier, a massive one. If innovations like Yes2Go remain largely inaccessible to the vast majority of people who need them, particularly in low and middle income countries where the HIV burden is highest, then, well, the full potential of these scientific breakthroughs simply cannot be realized. It truly forces us to consider who ultimately benefits from such advancements and what are the ethical responsibilities that come with them. Right. Despite these significant pricing concerns, though, there are plans for a global rollout, which is, I suppose, a hopeful sign. The World Health Organization, the WHO, is already preparing its guidance for lanacapavir use worldwide. Expectations are for its release by mid-July 2025, possibly around the time of the International AIDS Conference, and organizations like the Global Fund and PEPFAR, that's the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. My major players. Yeah, both major pillars of HIV treatment and prevention efforts worldwide, they've also signaled interest interest in rolling out this drug across low- and middle-income countries by the end of 2025. And, you know, on a positive note for the science itself, the team behind Lana Capavir recently received the Warren Alpert Foundation Prize. That's a major international award for their cutting-edge medical innovation. So recognition there. Good for them. The science is impressive. Okay, let's shift our focus again. Let's talk about the often underrated topic of funding. Because, let's face it, money truly makes the research world go round. And it profoundly impacts how quickly these breakthroughs can actually reach the people who need them. 
Unfortunately, um, on the U.S. front, we've seen a concerning development recently. The NIH here canceled funding for two major HIV vaccine partnerships, specifically the CHAVD consortia. These were vital collaborative networks really focused on advancing clinical vaccine science. And this is a significant concern for the long-term trajectory of HIV research, I mean. The reason given for these cuts, apparently a growing wave of vaccine skepticism, yes, even in Washington, has reportedly put certain programs under pressure. Mm. These consortia, they were fundamental to advancing clinical vaccine science, meaning the impact of these cuts isn't just about slowing down one single project. It could potentially delay the very pipeline of future vaccines. It directly impacts public health and frankly undermines our ability to respond effectively to global health challenges. Yet it's not all grim news on the funding front. There's a contrasting, very positive development coming from abroad, Norway. Norway just stepped up in a really big way, pledging nearly 1 billion U.S. dollars, that's 10 billion Norwegian kroner, to support GAVI and the Global Fund through 2030. That's huge. It is. GAVI, the Vaccine Alliance, works to improve access to new and underused vaccines for kids in the world's poorest countries. So that money, that substantial commitment, it will directly fuel vaccine and AIDS treatment programs especially in countries that simply can't afford them on their own. And what's fascinating here is the stark contrast in priorities you see playing out on a global scale. While Norway is demonstrating this really robust commitment to global health initiatives, foreign aid from the U.S. and the U.K., well, it's sadly declining. And these cuts are threatening HIV progress worldwide. Advocates, they fear these budget decisions could stall vital programs like PEPFAR and disrupt efforts to bring innovations like Lena Kapavir and future vaccines to the communities that need them most. This really raises an important question, doesn't it? What exactly is the global responsibility in the fight against HIV? And how do individual country decisions just ripple across the world, affecting the most vulnerable? So, okay, what does all of this mean for you, our listener, trying to stay informed on the fight against HIV? Well, it means a few things are pretty clear. Yes, there are vaccine setbacks. The mRNA trials being paused is a big one. But these germline targeting strategies, they're stepping up fast, offering new and genuinely exciting hope. We have significant prevention wins, like Alina Kapavir, now FDA approved. That truly could redefine pre-PP if, and it's a big if, its pricing is made fair and accessible globally. Right. The access piece is key. Totally key. And while funding seems shaky, maybe even declining, in the U.S., other global players like Norway are stepping up to help fill that gap. And to connect this to the bigger picture, you know, what you should keep your eyes on, look towards July. Specifically, watch for the World Health Organization's updated guidelines on Yastugo. And crucially, keep an eye on whether generic access to this groundbreaking medication actually becomes a reality worldwide. Those developments, they'll be key indicators of progress, progress on both global access and um, equitable distribution. Yeah, this deep dive really showcases the sheer complexity of the fight against HIV, doesn't it? It's a compelling story. You've got incredible scientific triumphs like the new vaccine approaches, the twice yearly PRP injection, yeah. amazing stuff. But they exist alongside these significant global political and economic hurdles, pricing, funding. It's just clear that progress isn't linear. It's not a straight line. It yeah. requires constant vigilance, constant collaboration across science, policy, global health, bringing everyone together. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, given that stark contrast we discussed between the immense potential of new treatments like Yes2Go and the accessibility challenges posed by their cost and, frankly, global political will. It raises an important question, I think, for you, the listener, to maybe mull over. What role can individuals play? What role can you play in advocating for equitable access to life-saving medications and ensuring that these scientific breakthroughs ultimately benefit everyone, not just those living in wealthy nations? That is a powerful thought to consider. Thank you for joining us on this deep dive into the latest in HIV advancements. We really hope this helped you stay informed and uh, keep asking those important questions.